I am going to show now the colors that go in my palettes. So the paints that I use are uh, my natural pigments. It's called the Rublev line. Natural pigments makes sort of a boutique line of paints that are traditionally manufactured. By traditionally manufactured, they're not made by a bunch of monks, but they are made with materials and recipes that are more traditional. They originally started off as um, their main focus was to make paints out of traditional non-man-made, non-synthetic pigments that you couldn't find anymore on the market. And they were binding them in just simple binders without additives or um, stabilizers. And so what you find with these paints is because they don't have stabilizers, because they don't have additives, you have just the pigment, just the oil. You have a really high pigment volume concentration. But because each pigment acts a little bit differently because it's ground to a different size and because each pigment requires a slightly different amount of oil or even a different type of oil, some of these have bodied oil, some of these have regular linseed oil, um, what you'll find is that each paint has a unique consistency, which is kind of cool. It's, uh, it's definitely a lot of fun to play around with. Um, sometimes it's a bit challenging to play around with, but uh, I'm going to show you now how I set up my palette with these colors. So here are the colors that I'm using the most these days. Um, traditionally, I'm more of a minimalist when it comes to my palette. I'm really a big um, advocate of having a limited palette, especially when you're a beginner. Um, but over the years, I've, I've added new colors to my palette and I've become addicted to a few of them. And now this is more or less the standard palette that I'm putting out these days onto my palette every day. Um, except for this guy. I don't know how that got in there, but there we go. Um, what you'll notice is that these all have really nice, beautiful labels on them with the colors, and they don't come that way, unfortunately. Um, I went and did that because I figured, you know, an hour of my time spent making these labels is going to save hours of my time rummaging through paints, trying to read the label and try to figure out which is which. Um, I don't know what it is when I'm painting, but my brain shuts off and I, I can't read very well, so I'm looking for hematite and I can't find hematite because my brain isn't processing the words. So I have the colors on the labels and I find that's a huge help. I try to keep them organized so I'm not wasting time looking for my paints. I really think it's important to have an organized workspace so that when you need to stop and grab a paint, you're not interrupting your flow by launching on a 10 minute search for a missing tube of paint. Um, I'm going to start by just laying out my palette for the day. Luckily, I will be doing some painting later, so I'm not going to be wasting all this paint. The first thing I'm going to do is put out my lead white number two. Now, there's a few different lead whites offered by Rublev. This is the one I prefer. Making the transition from titanium white, I found this one the easiest one to use. It is the creamiest, that, but it's still quite a bit different from, from titanium, and you'll see that in a minute. Now, when it comes straight out of the tube, it is very uh, thick and even sticky, you know, like it, it actually does kind of have a spaghetti-like effect. It will create little peaks. Um, that's a strength, um, but I also find it rather difficult to push it around. I'm, I'm not a bravura painter. I don't just leave big brush strokes everywhere. I like things to be delicately modeled and really smooth. So this interferes with me getting that effect. So what I usually need to do to make this workable for me um, is I need to add a little bit of oleo gel. It could be linseed oil or oleo gel, um, but oleo gel is just so damn convenient to use, so that's what I tend to use. Um, and you want to be careful when you do this to make sure you get the correct ratio, and the correct ratio is just whatever works for you. Too much oleo gel, and it gets to be too transparent and runny, too little, it's not really doing anything for you. And I just mix that in. And now I've got a really nice creamy paint that moves and pushes around just the way I want it to. Um, but there's one more thing I can do to this paint. I, I can use it this way, and I often do just use it this way. But if I want to really make the paint a bit beefier, because this goes on rather thin now, if I, if I want it to have a little bit more body, if I want to have some brush strokes and impasto, I will actually add a bit of Velasquez Medium. Um, Velasquez Medium and Impasto Medium are rather similar, so either one of those will do. But I like the Velasquez Medium more and more these days. And uh, what Velasquez Medium is, is a pigment, a colorless pigment. Even though it appears white, it's actually a colorless pigment. You'll see that when you add other colors to it that it actually doesn't tint those colors. It's a colorless pigment plus a binder. And uh, basically that makes it a paint. And since it's a paint, you can add as much of it as you want to your paints without actually changing the nature of your paint. So 
Um, one of the problems with adding medium to your paint, of course, is that you're weakening the paint film. Like the more oil you add to your paint, the more you're weakening the paint film. Um, you're ruining that ideal ratio of pigment to binder. But because Velasquez medium is actually technically a paint in structure, um, you're just mixing more paint into your paint. So you could add as much as you want if you wanted to. So um, now I've got a paint that actually flows really nicely. It's really soft and buttery, but it actually has a bit more oomph to it, a bit more body, and it will stand up to the vigor of my brush strokes a bit better. Now you might wonder why didn't I just leave the paint in its original state because what I essentially did was I just made it runnier and then thicker again. But the texture of this is actually completely different than the texture of the lead white out of the tube. And I vastly prefer this one. So this is what I do. So I like to use this when I'm painting flesh. You know, I get nice meaty paint application. I like it when I'm painting white drapery. Um, but apart from that, um, I don't usually add the impasto medium. I just add the oleo gel. So that's been pre-mixed. I'm going to put that right there. I like to keep my white right near my thumb. And the reason is because a lot of my flesh mixing happens right here. And to me, that's just comfortable to be working like this. I don't like to be working like that. I see some people put the whites right in their elbows and they spend the whole time painting like this. The next color on my palette is chrome yellow light. Um, I used to use the chrome primrose a lot. And then I discovered this one and decided this one just suited me a little bit better. Um, it's a very, very nice color, very similar to cad yellow. Um, and it's interesting having this on my palette because actually it's been years since I've had any CADs on my palette or anything that's chromatic. I was a very low chroma painter up until about a year ago and then I finally went and added some chromatic colors back on my palette. I, I, used, to, I used to not be very discriminating about my colors, like I would you know, try anything that worked. But uh, then I went through this phase where I was trying to discipline myself and work with low chroma colors on a limited palette and that was really good for me. But now I'm sort of going back and I'm adding back the chromatic colors and it's, it's been a lot of fun. This is Blue Ridge Yellow Ochre. It's very similar to say Windsor Newton Yellow Ochre Pale or Mars Yellow by Old Holland. Um, it's just a really important color for my palette. I've always liked having this color on my palette. It's really good for flesh, just good for everything. Um, and out of all the yellow ochres that they have, this is my favorite both for the texture um, and for the tinting strength. Um, and maybe that's just my bias because it's so similar to the yellows I've used in the past. But um, that's the one I prefer. And it's just a really nice texture straight out of the tube, so I don't have to do anything to it. This is orange ochre. This is one of my favorite colors. Um, I can actually technically get a color very similar to it by mixing the yellow ochre and the, and the burnt sienna or the hematite or whatever. But uh, I just love how it comes straight out of the tube and it ends up being almost the perfect color for the red hair of some of my redheaded models. So um, we're at the stage in this tube where there's some oil separation happening. That's one thing that happens with these paints quite a bit is oil separation because they don't have stabilizers. So what I do is I just squeeze a bit of paint out onto the paper towel and clean up this mess while I'm at it. Otherwise it just winds up on my hands at a later date. And I just let that sit on the paper towel for a little bit. And what you'll see is through capillary diffusion in the paper towel, the oil gets wicked out of the blob of paint. And after about a minute or so, you can just take it off, mix it up just a little bit, just to make sure it's consistent throughout. And there's the next color. So setting up this palette is a little bit higher maintenance than um, some of the palettes I've had in the past. Oh, that one's also separating quite a bit. I find that most of these paints have a oily spot in them and then you get through it and then towards the end of the tube of paint you have this really uh, dry paint. It's not actually dry, I just what I mean to say is that the, um, the oil ratio has dropped down so it's mostly pigment at that point. And then when that happens you just fix the situation by adding a bit of oil and I think I've got a tube of paint like that so I can demonstrate that in a little bit. And the next color here is hematite. Sorry, I didn't say what that one was. That is actually orange molybdate. It's a really high chroma, orangey red. And I don't use it a ton, but when I need it, it really does help me out. Um, especially in like really dark shadow areas where I need to bump up the chroma without raising the value. So um, yeah, this is hematite. It's pretty similar to French burnt sienna, which is what I used to use instead of this one. Um, I still really love French burnt sienna, but this is the tube I have out, so I tend to use it these days. Um, but I might switch back, you know, they're, they're so similar. The only difference is French burnt sienna is much more transparent than the hematite. 
and the hematite is a little bit rosier too. Um, and the textures are a bit different. The French burnt sienna is rather gritty and interesting. Um, the hematite is kind of gelatinous and, and blobby. <laughs> Um, this is Matter Lake. I don't know if they make Matter Lake anymore. This is a really old tube. I think they've replaced it with a lizard and crimson now. Um, but that's also just a staple on my palette for flesh. Um, I usually use that in the rosy parts of a person's face. Not throughout, just mostly cheeks, lips, uh, you know, the intense reds in someone's eyes. And usually it ends up being mixed with the, the uh, hematite. Now this is called Cypress Burnt Umber Warm. Now, I love this color. It's, it's just a fantastic color. But uh, one thing about it is, you know, since I use it in the shadows a lot, especially in flesh, since I use it in, in dark areas and shadows, often pure, um, I like it to go on thin. You know, like I like to keep my shadows a bit thinner and my lights a bit thicker. And this is just a little bit too, pasty and thick for me to, to easily drag it thinly into shadow areas. So what I do is I do the oleo gel trick again. So again, you can use oleo gel or linseed oil, it doesn't matter. Um, I just find it so easy to use the oleo gel. And I just mix a teensy bit of oil in there and it just spreads the paint right out. Now it flows so much better and I can spread that thinly in shadow areas now. I do the exact same thing with the next color, which is the Cypress Umber Dark. Um, so that as well, same thing. I would like that to be a much more flowing texture, but I'm not going to bother demonstrating that again for you. Um, next up is my Ultramarine Blue. Um, this is an important color for me. I use this a ton. And I like to keep it here nestled between the umbers and the black because I use it intermixed with my umbers a lot. Like you get some really interesting neutral tints when you mix this with the Cypress Umber Dark or even with the Cypress Burnt Umber Warm. Next up, um, I'm not going to put this out today because I'm not going to use it in my painting, but I, this is a really interesting color. It's called Roman Black and it is, a, it is a black that is noticeably lighter in value than other blacks when you put it on the palette. Actually, I will put it out so you can see that. Um, and what I like to use it for is flesh. Um, I never used to, no, that's not true. I actually did used to use black and flesh, but it's a while there I didn't use black and flesh. Um, the problem with using black and flesh is, is usually just that it's too cool. It is, it's too cool for school. No, it's, it's too cool to work with. It makes your flesh tints look a little too sickly or greenish or muddy or whatever. But this black, the Roman black, is actually very neutral. And uh, I used to mix up a neutral tint for my flesh, taking black and burnt umber, but um, that's just a little booger there. Um, but uh, this I can use straight out of the tube, so I don't have to pre-mix my black with a brown to warm it up. And this, can, this is actually a great neutralizer for flesh tone. So anywhere where the flesh gets less intense in color, less saturated, and it gets more neutral, um, I get my students to use this to add it to the flesh. It's like the simplest way to get a student to lower the chroma on the flesh. We're not using compliments. We're not being elaborate or complicated in how we're, how we're mixing colors. We're just doing the simplest thing, which is take a neutral black and add it to the flesh. And usually we have this pre-mixed in tints, like, you know, different values. And um, it's a really nice, simple way to control the chroma of your flesh. But I'm not working on flesh today, so I'm just going to take it off my palette. But I hope you can see um, in this film that this is lighter in value than this bone black. It's, it's just kind of interesting. It's not altogether very different from, say, Mars black. Um, I think chemically it's the same thing. So I'll take that off. Now, the final color here is bone black. Now, this is a really nice, dark, glossy black. Um, I think I'm at the point in the tube now where there's a little less oil. And you can see, as a result, it's a little bit more matte than I would like. Um, I want my black to be as glossy as possible when I put it in the painting because I actually want to see how dark it actually is. If I were to paint this in my painting right now, it's matte, you know, I, and I might trick myself about how dark it really is, and then I would varnish my painting and then it would get darker. So I want to make sure that that black is the actual value it's going to be when I varnish the painting. So if I have to, I will add a little bit of oleo gel to this as well, and, and just, a, just a teensy little bit. And you know, I'm basically just restoring the oil ratio that the paint really ought to have. Because like I said, the oil does separate in the tube and then you wind up with these patches of paint 
where there's just not as much oil. So that's already glossier and darker and now I've got a more accurate picture of what that black is going to look like. So if I put that pure on my painting, I, I know exactly what it's going to look like when it's varnished. Now the problem with bone black is, and this is a problem with most blacks, um, unless they're like an iron oxide black, is that they just take forever to dry and even when they seem to be dry, the paint film seems to be really weak and that's, it's just not very helpful, um, especially since as you know from my previous video, I like to take a solvent, which is like the essential oil of petroleum or the rublisol light, and I like to use that to uh, saturate my paintings and take a look at them. And if this color still isn't dry, and usually it's the last one to dry, those areas might come off my painting. So what I do to accelerate the drying of the bone black, there's a couple things you can do. One is to take an alkyd medium of some sort and add just a touch in there to accelerate the drying. Or you can just do something even simpler and you can take a little bit of your Cypress Umber Dark, which is really dark in value. Like if you look at that, we're not really going to alter the value too much. And just mix that in there. Now, umbers dry really quickly because of their manganese content. So I'm just adding some manganese dryer basically to, uh, to my black. And that will dry way faster. So there we go. So that's how I set up my palette. It can be a little bit uh, labor intensive some days. But usually I'm not talking when I do it, so usually I get it done in about two minutes. Um, and uh, and that's, that's how it's normally set up when I'm, when I'm painting. Um, I'm sure most of you guys know that you're supposed to hold a palette this way, but I was just holding it and I was just thinking to myself, you know, we had a student the other day in a class and he was holding his palette like this. So just, just FYI, it's, it's always going to be like this. It's, this is never going to catch on. That's never going to be trendy. I'm just, just going to put that out there. Um, so this is the order that I like to have my paints in. I like to go from my lightest colors, through my yellows, through my orange, my reds, my browns, my blue, my black. If there's a green, it'll go in here. And I just kind of like that nice rainbow, rainbow look. Um, there's, there's a reason why I have this laid out. You know, you can lay out your paints however you want to lay them out. But I think that whatever you do, you should have um, a method to your madness. There should be a reason why your paints are laid out the way they are. And then you should stick to that because having the paints exactly where you know they're going to be is really helpful when you're working. I'm going to show some photos of Dave's chaotic, insane palette where he just puts paints all over the place and they change location every single day. And then sometimes he asks me to come over and look at his painting and, and show him how I would paint something, which is something I ask him to do for my paintings too. And I can't find any of his colors and it really makes me angry. Um, <laughs> there might be name calling. Um, but anyways, I think it's really important to pick an order and then stick to it because when you're painting, you want to be able to just intuitively reach for the color and you don't want to be hunting around for it. And then furthermore, sometimes you get colors that actually look very similar. Um, and if you're painting under not so optimal light conditions, you might mistake one color for another. And then if you're not used to say, you know, this is my umber over here, this is my black over here. If these were reversed one day, you might accidentally grab some black and you meant to grab some umber and then, you know, you just, you just create a mess for yourself. Um, there is one nice thing about how I've laid out my colors. Um, and I mean, this was just, this was just the order that was given to me by my first painting teacher and I've never changed it because I don't question authority, but I like to have my yellows and my oranges and there. I like them all grouped like this because if there's an accidental contamination between the two and really there's not a lot of space between these paints, you know, like if I had a big brush, you could see how I could accidentally muck them up and get, get paint and mixing between the two. But if you have similar colors next to each other, it's not such a big deal if I get a bit of yellow ochre into this yellow. It's not such a big deal if I get a bit of cypress umber or dark, cypress umber dark into my cypress burnt umber warm, because um, they're so similar. But if I had this right next to that and they started intermixing, it would just be a disaster. So my palette's almost ready to start painting with today. There's just a couple more things I have to do. So um, one thing I like to do is I like to have a gob of oleo gel out and uh, this I just use whenever I need to to help with the flow of my paint so if paint needs to be spread out a bit more thinly or if it's just a bit sticky or say I'm working with my umbers and I decided I didn't add quite enough oleo gel it's right there it's ready for me to use and you know it's so much easier to use that than to get a palette cup like I used to have palette cups and I put stuff in them and I just spill them all over the front of my clothes so I, I much prefer just having a dab of oleo gel on my palette. To me, this is just the greatest invention ever. I, I love it. Um, and then the other thing I like to have out is my Velasquez medium. 
So, you know, I've already pre-mixed it into the white. Um, let's say I didn't, you know, then I'd have this out and it'd be handy. Even if I did, it's still handy. Um, so I just put a, a bit of that out too. And I'm putting a very sparing amount out right now because um, I might not use it later. But, uh, you know, I, could, I might put out a ton if I knew that I was going to be working in an area that required lots of impostos. All right. Well, that's it. That is my palette. These are the colors that I'm using these days. And that concludes today's emission. <laughs>